sahana vavatu, sahana bhunaktu, sahaviryan karavavahe, te jasvina vadhi tamastu, ma vidvisha vahai. Om Shanti 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 Hi. May we be protected. May we be nourished. May we acquire the capacity to study and understand the scriptures. May our studies be brilliant and may we not quarrel with each other. So last week, we have done a comprehensive review of the 18 values so far. So we need not revise them again. Rather, we can jump straight into the next value, 19. And 20 will be the last values, and that will finish up to verse 11. And then we can go into verse 12, and that will start to change the topic of what we have been talking about. Uh, value 19 will be Tattva Jnanartha Darshanam. Tattva means truth. Truth in the sense of the irreducible reality of anything and everything. Jnana is used here in the compound. Tattva dhyana is self-knowledge. Artha means purpose or an end in the sense of a goal. Darshana is sight or vision. So, tattva dhyana artha darshana is keeping in view the purpose of the knowledge of truth. Knowledge of truth, tattva dhyana, is the thing to be known. Jnaya in life for which the values indicated earlier by the word jnana prepare the mind. So what is the basic thing to be known in life? The basic knowledge to be discovered in life is the knowledge of what is, such as what is real, what is fundamental, what is sought is the knowledge of the truth or the fundamental nature of oneself. The creation and the creator this knowledge of the truth of what is, the truth of everything, is the meaning of tattva jnana. The basic knowledge of the truth can also be called the knowledge of self, atma jnana, because upon inquiry, the irreducible reality of oneself turns out to be not different from the irreducible reality of God and creation. What is the purpose of self-knowledge? Um, to discover one within oneself an overwhelming value for keeping in view the goal of self-knowledge. One needs to know what does one gain from self-knowledge? What is the purpose served by self-knowledge? All human purposefulness can be classified under four headings. The collective Sanskrit name for these four headings is Purusharta. From Purusha, human being, and Arta, purpose for which a human being longs and struggles. They are dharma, artha, karma, and moksha. The fourfold pursuit in a human life, dharma, ethical standards, refers to the goals of conforming one's behavior to scripture sanctioned ethical norms in order to obtain merit or avoid demerit in this life or the next. Alternatively, for the one who is not an adherent to any particular scriptural sanctions. It means simply the universal set of ethical standards mandated by human free will and shaped by one's wish to be treated in a certain manner by one's fellow human being. Arta, security, refers to the goal of acquiring the thing that one thinks will make one secure, such as money, property, possessions, power, influence, name, and fame. Karma, pleasures is the goal of enjoying the varieties of pleasures life affords, such as physical comfort, sensory delight, and mind-pleasing escapes. Moksha, liberation, is the goal of discovering freedom from the hands of time, freedom from change, age, death, grief, and loss, escape from never-ending sense of inadequacy and incompleteness from all forms of limitation, the desire to be rid of desire itself. Where then does self-knowledge belong? There is only one category left, and that is liberation, moksha, which in, is in fact where atma jnana fits. Self-knowledge serves the purpose of moksha. The value tattva jnanatha darshana means keeping in sight the goal of moksha, which is complete freedom from the human sense of limitation, incompleteness, and inadequacy. 
state of mind of the person who constantly keeps in view moksha is called the seeker of liberation is called mumukshu. Thus, the value of tattva, jnanatha, darshana can also be called the value of mumukshutva, the value for the human freedom. Why is knowledge the only means to freedom, moksha? It is because the freedom sought is limitlessness itself, that choiceless human goal underlying all other human struggles for limited ends. Limitlessness is not something that can be created or produced. If limitlessness exists, it is an ever-existent fact to, the, to be discovered. If my essential nature is that of a limited being, I can never become limitless. Limitlessness by definition can never be the end product of a process of becoming. An endless series of limited things will not constitute limitless, limitlessness. Limited means cannot produce limitlessness. Limitlessness either is or it is not. Therefore, if I am by essential nature bound, there can be no moksha for me. I can never be absolutely liberated. Often, as I look at the world around me and, my, and at myself, I judge, I judge myself to be bound, limited, inadequate, and sor sorrow prone. At the same time, there is within me that love for freedom that in occasional moments of joy or insight seems to be fulfilled as fact, contradicting all my experiences of inadequacy. Thus, even though my usual experience is that of being limited, on the basis of my innate need to be free, backed by intimations and that freedom may be my nature, I'm led to search for knowledge of the truth of myself to discover whether or not I am that being I want to be. If the freedom I seek is an accomplished fact, my failure to appreciate that fact can only be due to ignorance. And if my only problem is one of ignorance, search for liberation becomes a search for the knowledge that will dispel the ignorance that keeps me from knowing myself as I am. So value 19, Tattva Dhyanartha Darshanam, which is commitment to self-knowledge. According to Vedanta, understanding the whole reality, understanding the self as that reality requires three pillars to be ascertained. And if you think about a pillar, what does a pillar do? It holds a structure. It supports a structure. Like you walk into a Colosseum or uh, a temple, a temple as grandiose as it is, right? the entire temple is sustained by the pillars, which we don't often look at. We just look at everything other than the pillars because they just seem to be there on the side, but we're all throughout enjoying that temple. If there's a little crack in that pillar, then you can certainly go unnoticed for a while. But through the course of time, that one little compromise, that means not attending to the pillar, can lead to the collapse of the entire structure. And then the loss of knowledge and the loss of uh, something that the people of that time and place have worked very hard for. So similarly, a pillar in Vedanta is... Uh, crucial to be completely covered from all angles and to looked at over and over again. Because if one pillar is left alone, then we may think our knowledge is firm. However, when a pre situation presents ourselves with some challenge in life, then it may compromise our knowledge. It may cause us to doubt ourselves. And then it may cause us to go to a different path. Question is, what are these pillars, right? Because we need to discuss the Vedantic pillars. The first pillar is the Jiva pillar. We we'll always start with ourselves because the Jiva is the closest that we have. Now, if we look at a Jiva made up of parts, physical parts, thoughts, memories, various components, just like a machine. We're not going to compare ourselves to a machine, but it's a good analogy. Right. The machine, the synergy of it is made up of different parts. Every part has to work in order for that machine to uh, do its amazing work that it does, its function. And just like a machine, if you break it down, you see components, gears and wires and chips. And so much work goes behind that machine to create it. And you can just keep on looking even inside those parts of the machine. And you go, well, what is a gear made of? What's made of metal and alloys? So just like that with a jiva, every component that we look at, any aspect of ourselves as an individual, we cannot find a final building block. 
right? We cannot find the Jiva building block, the reality that creates the Jiva. Right? We cannot find that within the aspect of the microscope or uh, any kind of perception or inference means. Because no matter what we look at, it's always dependent upon something else. So we say, well, I found the final building block, thought. But then you say, well, what is a thought? It's nothing but tendencies in relation to something of the past. So there's always this association to something else. And for that reason, we cannot come to the final building block of the jiva that dictates what a jiva is and how the jiva is going to be. Body, parts, mind, memories environment right according to what we've done some time ago now some skaras habits could be of this life could be of previous lives all of them are what make up the jiva so if we analyze the jiva what do we discover every form every experience about us as a human being as a jiva it's a part, this part we call mitya. And this part depends on something else. That which it depends on, we call satyam. So that's all satyam and mitya means. That means mitya from present standpoint seems like it is independent, right? So now it gains the status called, in Sanskrit, what we call satyam. It looks like it's got its own truth, right? Individual, let's say hand, right? Hand is satyam. But the moment you look inside the hand, you go, well, it's blood and veins. So now the entire hand becomes, takes on a new name called mitya. So all that means is now the mitya hand depends on its truth. And what is its truth? The blood and the veins and the cells. And then you go, okay, let's stop at the cells. Okay, that's the final satyam here. But if you look into those cells and blood and all that, then you find, for example, the, uh, the, the, the base, the DNA within that, right? The proteins, amino acids. And you say, okay, let's stop there. So that becomes the final satyam. But then you look even further. And so you keep on reducing, you keep on switching between mitya satyam, mitya satyam, dependent, independent, dependent, independent. So independent becomes dependent when you look closer into it. And you say, ah, got it. And then we find out new instruments, science go, ah, that's not the final. It's no longer the final satyam. There's a more satyam. There's a, a greater satyam than this one. So that's how science works. Keeps on looking more and more, and therefore they keep changing the satya mitya definition on the basis of what they can and how far they can perceive. Now, for a jiva, what is the final satyam? We already discussed this before we began. In fact, chapter thirteen, we were discussing this. The final satyam, after which we can no longer break it down, which cannot go further than that, is ever fresh, ever new awareness. Because we cannot, um, um, you know, if we say there's something behind that, then the question will be, well, who is it that knows about the fact that there is something behind awareness? Well, I do. So then you cannot be, there cannot be something behind awareness because it is dependent upon you, the awareness, in order to say that. So the final building block of a jiva comes to awareness. And this awareness is because of which the I person gets to tell the story about this jiva. You know, every jiva has a story, right? We ask, and what's your story, Lorena? What's your story, Justine? What's your story, Lloyd? And I was like, yeah, let me tell you my story. And here's what I went through. And here's the experiences I've got. And, you know, here's what I understand, what I don't understand. Just ongoing stories. So in the, all of these stories for all of us are only in this presence because of this awareness, this awareness shining on everyone's mind. And it seems like we all have different realities or different experiences, but those experiences only belong to the building blocks of the jiva, like the mind, like the body, like the story, like the memories, like the samskaras, but they're only in the light of this awareness. That's the first pillar of Vedanta. What's the first pillar, Victor? The jiva. And tell us a little bit about the jiva. What does the jiva consist of, Robert? The jiva consists of... Um body, mind, it's a reducible reality. It's mitya because it's dependent for its existence upon satya, that upon which it exists, which is the awareness or the atma which I am. Good. And what is the final substance? What is the final reality of the jiva, Luciana? Awareness. Okay, good. So. All right. So this is the first pillar of the jiva. 
The second pillar is Jagat. Jagat means the world. Now, when you say, what is the Jagat? We define it as time, space, and objects in time and space. So if you ever want to pass the test, what is Jagat? You say time, space, and objects. It also means past, present, and the future. So you can never say yesterday uh, going outside the Jagat. You're always going to talk time in what we call Jagat. Tomorrow, aspirations, many of them I have. That's Jagat. Many lifetimes ago, that's Jagat. Same with the Jagat. We cannot find the final building block in this world. Let's take time. One year, 365 days. One day, 24 hours. One hour, 60 minutes. One minute, 60 seconds. One second, we go into milliseconds. Picoseconds. And then we go to the smallest, at least that the scientists can do, which is length time, 10 to the negative 44 of a second. That's basically 0 0.000. Now it times those 0 000s, those three zeros, about 17 times. So, okay, 0, 0, 0, 1 times, 0, 0, 0, 2 times, 0, 0, 0, 3 times. So like that's 17 times, 0, 1 something, I don't remember, of a second. So imagine how short that is, time. In other words, even time is satya metya, shares the same because it is still within one of these pillars. You look at time and it is resolvable into something even smaller, just like a jiva. You take something gross, hand, and then you keep on going down, 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 subatomic particle level. Same thing with time. Space is also units within units. Just like time is units within units, space similarly is between A and B, between this and this. Suppose it's one meter. Now, what is a meter? 100 centimeters. What is 100 centimeters? Let's take one centimeter, 10 millimeters, and then, okay, let's take one millimeter. And you keep on going smaller and smaller into 10 to the negative 35 of a meter. That's 0 0.000, 12 times like that, 0 0.16 of a meter. So 0 0.000000000, like that, 12 times 0 0.16 of a meter. Very short, right? That's called planked time. That's as far as the scientists can postulate using their sophisticated equipment. What I'm showing you here is even space and time itself is no different than anything else within this world. It is resolvable units within units within units within units, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller beyond the reach of our current capacity that we can use with our instrumentation. And then time further gets reduced into concepts because time inside a dream is very different than time inside the waking state. And time inside the, uh, the deep sleep state is no more. There's no time in deep sleep. So concept, even time, no matter how much you reduce it, it doesn't matter if it's blank lamp, it is still a concept because it's relative. You put your hand on a stove, one second is like one hour. Or you're doing something fun, something that you enjoy five hours, 10 minutes, right? Completely relative. So even time is subject to change. And this is the, everyone's experience. Everyone has a different perspective of time depending upon the one of these three pillars that we are talking about. The environment contributes to that. The jiva contributes to that. All of the components are interconnected. Therefore, they are able to modify the components which they are connected to. That's why even time is being, you can even modify time itself because it is dependent upon the observer, but also the environment upon which the observer happens to be associated with. Okay, so the second pillar is what, Sunita? Jagat, which is time, space, and objects. Does time, space, and objects also share the same satya relationship? Yes. Okay, that's good. Any other further notes that I haven't mentioned? It can be measured. Yeah, it can be measured. And is it relative? It is. Yeah. Raw concept. Yeah, good. And give me an example of relativity of time, uh, Mina. The time in deep sleep, the time in dream state, as well as whenever we do the activities that are, that we are, which are fun for us, we feel the time passes 
uh, soon. Otherwise, it takes a little long. So time is a concept. It is relative, not even, it is relative even in this Jagat world. Third pillar, Ishwara in Sanskrit. In English, cause of the universe. So when we say God, when I say God in the Course of Lord, all I mean is cause of the universe. So we say who or what created the Jiva and the Jagat. Answer is Ishwara. And how do we define Ishwara? Ishwara is all knowledge, all power. It is both the efficient and the material cause of the universe. All knowledge, all power. That means there's no knowledge of power which is excluded out of Ishwara. It's not like Ishwara calls up its Ishwara, and a, Ishwara friend and goes, hey, I need some power, man, to uh, sustain my universe, right? Everything is within this Ishwara, within this power, within this knowledge. And it is both the efficient, efficient just means the intelligent cause, the intelligent cause that's capable of putting together those components which create the next mitya or satya, depending on their relationship. It is both the efficient and the material cause of the universe. So again, it doesn't borrow intelligence from somewhere else, nor does it borrow material from somewhere else. All the material, all the intelligence comes from this one reality that we call Ishwara. And this intelligence, we also call Ishwara this intelligence, it manifests the tiniest of the particles. So it does two things. One, it manifests the tiniest of the tiniest of the tiniest particles. That's the particles that we study in science, in biology, in chemistry, and then we create names for them in order to differentiate them one between the other. In fact, all of our sciences that we research and look into are only but expressions of looking into one particular area of life and then saying some studying phenomena and then writing or jotting those phenomena down in our books and then postulating how they could be connected and what is their relationship to some other phenomena in life. So it does two things. One, it manifests the tiniest of the particles. And number two, not only does it manifest, but once the manifested are present, once they are manifest, it then intelligently puts those particles together so that they may serve or have some uh, intelligent or purposeful function in respect to some other component, which is also being subject to these two, both manifest and also endowed with an intelligent function, put together intelligently. So this means that every assembly at every level in the past, present, and future is pervaded by none other than this very all knowledge, all power, which is both the efficient and the material cause of the entire universe. And because that is the case, it means that every assembly helplessly has an intelligent role. Is that not true when we study our sciences? We study any area of life. We always see a relationship of that thing having a relationship with some other thing. Why? Because all knowledge, all power does not make mistakes. It's not like it goes, oops, I made a mistake. You know, I created this. I should have not created this. It's inefficient. We don't need it anymore. So whatever is created at the smallest level of assembly, the smallest particle, it enjoys helplessly an intelligent function in respect to some other function or some other creation that is created on the other side of the world, other side of the you know, language, uh, or whatever it is. There's always this beautiful interconnected web, an intelligent web that works synergistically together. Nothing is out of place. And if something is out of place, that is only because the mind that is witnessing that phenomena fails to appreciate or understand how it is actually in the right place. If not right now, it certainly will be in the future or has been in the past. And therefore now it's going through a different time where it's not as it used to be, therefore I'm not able to understand it. But when a mind becomes sensitive enough, it's able to witness it. In other words, even the mind that witnesses the phenomena itself is also a product of these two. One, it is a coming together of the smallest of the smallest. And that coming together is also now endowed with what we call the subtle body, which is able to witness not only other creations made by this Ishwara, caused by this Ishwara, but also is able to appreciate it. So that's the only difference between a jiva and something that does not share a subtle body like a rock. 
A rock too is the same intelligence that you and I are as a person. But you and I as a jiva have one extra capacity called the subtle body. And this subtle body is able to capture the very environment that has been created or manifested by this very intelligence that we call Ishwara. And therefore, thus we create these lovely uh, phenomena and books to, uh, to, to study. And then we create names and we can go to schools to learn about this. Now, the question is, how can all knowledge, all power organize? How does it organize? How can it organize? How do you and I organize anything? How do we create? We first have to be conscious, right? We have to exist in order to do that. So how does this all knowledge, all power called Ishwara, how does this organize the entire universe that we haven't even understood? The vastness of the universe, mind boggling beyond the mind cannot be grasped. It cannot unless it is blessed by some other reality. And that reality we call Brahman. And what is Brahman? It is Sat Chit, existence, awareness. So let's just take Sat and Chit. How does this now tie in with this reality called all knowledge, all power, which in short we call Ishwara? For all knowledge, all power to exist, it needs existence, does it not? For your knowledge to exist, it first needs the template of existence. So even all knowledge, all power depends on Sat, depends on what we call Brahman, the reality of existence, just general, pure existence. So in the presence of existence, which is Sat, which is how we describe Brahman, in the presence of existence, knowledge, power, all knowledge, all power is. All knowledge, all power exists only because of Sat. And what is Sat? Brahman, the final reality. So even Ishwara depends on another reality, and that is the final reality called Brahman. And in order for this all knowledge, all power, which now enjoys existence because of existence itself, in order for it to organize together, to put together the smallest of the smallest into the next assemblies to create what we now call the world, it needs one more thing. And what is that? It needs to be aware of itself, doing whatever it's doing. Just like a jiva needs to be aware of one's intelligence. Let me use my intelligence of, suppose, uh, medicine. Suppose you have uh, Ayurveda or some kind of uh, medicine knowledge. Knowledge exists because of existence. But so what? That is not enough. One needs to be conscious of their knowledge, which enjoys existence, in order to make use of that knowledge. So all knowledge, all power depends on sat. All knowledge, all power in the presence of existence, that all knowledge, all power is. It doesn't stop there. Because it is, what is the nature of, of existence? Awareness. Therefore, not only does it exist, but also its own limitless knowledge and power is made to be self-aware. It is self-aware of itself. And this is what we call the Purusha, the being of the universe. Just like a jiva has power and has knowledge, limited in every aspect. Like that, Ishwara, except it's not a jiva. Like that, all knowledge, all power, completely conscious of every aspect that happens in the past, present, and future. Because of Brahman, Sat and Chit. What is the third pillar? Ishwara. Okay. And how do we define Ishwara, Lloyd? All uh, knowledge, all power. And Ishwara is also the efficient and material cause of the universe. Okay. And what does Ishwara depend on for it's all knowledge, all power to operate. It requires something for its glory to be. Consciousness. And? Uh, awareness. 
Uh, she just said consciousness awareness is the same thing. Okay. Um, intelligence? Um, intelligence, it is all knowledge or power already. Um, yes. What else uh, starts with uh, E? Goknur uh, knows. Existence. Existence, okay. Existence and, and consciousness. Good. And what is Goknur uh, existence, consciousness in Sanskrit? Uh, Sat is existence and consciousness is Chit. And what is the definition of Brahman, Goknur? Sat Chitananda. Good. In other words, we've just now addressed we haven't, yeah. we haven't addressed Ananda yet. Good, good. Yeah. Sat Chit Ananda. Okay, Sat Chit. So the question is now, what is this value about? What is commitment to self-knowledge? The answer is, it is the value for this primary goal. And what is the primary goal in life, according to this value? Ascertaining tattva jnana, the knowledge of the three pillars. So what is value 19 about? Ascertaining well and firmly and consistently the ins and outs, the details of these three pillars, not as an intellectual pursuit, let's study philosophy, but directly, intimately. So the question is now, why should I assimilate this knowledge? Why should I assimilate this self-knowledge firmly? How is it relevant to me? Okay, first of all, to ask this question, that's the mind now kicking and going. No, no, I like my individuality. I want to preserve my individuality. I don't want to lose my individuality to this uh, total reality. I'm afraid I want to protect myself. You know, I'm going to just like walk out and not care about anything. It creates big stories about, uh, they're endless. So then it sabotages, creates these questions. You know, how is this relevant to me? I've got kids, I've got a job, you know, this is all, I'm busy. Some other time in the future, Quite genius, some minds is. To get over this question, we need to show this very mind that's doubting. We need to show it how its current state of affairs are limited in nature, how it is actually and not its in best interest to sustain this sense of limitation that it's undergoing, that it got so accustomed to for lifetimes. So, what are we all seeking on the surface? Passions and desires all sorts, aspirations, endless. Everyone's got a different passion and desire. I want to be this. I want to go here. I want to achieve that. All right. Become this. In other words, constant becoming. I want to become this, become that. But what is behind all of this becoming and pursuit? What is the one common shared desire behind all of these stories and the books and being out there and doing this and going here and going there is just drama what's the common pursuit for everyone we feel complete we yeah. feel limited happy to try and feel complete what would be motivating one to keep moving to keep seeking to keep looking more 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 Goodness. what was that the need to feel complete the need to feel complete, right? So in other words, there's this inherent sense of limitation. And to get rid of that limitation, unbeknownst how to do so, what do we do as a seeker, as a general jiva who is born in this world? We pursue the three means, the purusharthas, that everyone else is pursuing. Because we see all around us, okay? There are some people are pursuing a little bit of security, some karma, some pleasure, some... Uh, you know, some are noble acts. Okay, so this is what I should do too because everyone else is doing it. So what are these three purusharthas? The first one is artha. Artha means when you and I have defined what the word security means. It's a very powerful word. Marketers use it, you know, in different ways. Security. You want security, we'll give you security. And we have all defined what this word security means. Everyone. By the time they're 16 or 17, of course, this word changes a lot, right? What security means. By the time one's 16, Girls and boys are security. By the time they're, you know, grown up, you know, job is security. So this keeps on changing. So then the person, having established their definition of security, will then go and look in the world in order to fulfill that definition of security. So this means that pursuit will be different for everyone because everyone is born in a different family, different environment. Therefore, they have, their definition of security is different. 
This is why there are so many pursuits in this world. No one's doing the same thing, right? Someone's trying to, um, you know, I mean, giving respect to everyone, but everyone's pursuing different things because the drive behind it is the same. I define what security means. Therefore, I will pursue stocks. That's my version of security. Put stocks. Let's research stocks. Partnership. Any kind of relationship. Partnership. Position. Title. Right? But behind it all, it's the same thing. Every single person behind it all, I just want self-fulfillment. And I think that this will give me self-fulfillment. Therefore, according to my idea, my definition, let me pursue more of this. The rest of us, we go for karma. This is our savior. Karma means delights, right? So in other words, whatever means, whatever is delightful in life, this is our idea of salvation. It could be physical delights, spas, <laughs> big industry, right? Yeah, I just want to come back to security for a moment. I thought of it more in terms of not so much fulfillment, but as being fear-based, uh, the need for permanence and that can be reduced basically to avoiding death, death of what you currently have. So I think security is trying to maintain a sense of permanence out of fear rather than looking for a positive fulfillment in life. Sure, good. That's a good point. So Robert is defining security as in, what I already have, I want to preserve because it brings some sort of um, delight in life. And that could also be another definition of security. Now, the security that I've mentioned was that initial stage. Let me pursue something that will give me that stage of what I can define as secure. Now I feel secure. I've got a big home, right? I've got stocks. I've got uh, bonds and real estate and business. This is my definition of security. I've got one with however many zeros in the bank account. Now I'm secure. All right. And then after that, of course, we have a journey of now trying to um, create security out of what we've already pursued to be secure. So we go into maintenance mode. Okay. So then we got physical delights. And we've got emotional delights. This is company. This is friendship. And this is just general, uh, maybe pets. That's a good one today. Snake, snake pet. I don't know how you can get delight out of that, but it works. A hamster, hamster delight. So much crazy stuff today, right? I think there were virtual reality headsets, right? Um, like yourself in the room and play computer games. It helps a lot. It can help the person to uh, keep them focused. So because see, suppose you take away computer games from your kid, then it's better than your kid going, you know, and, and doing some drugs or something, right? So in other words, there are always two sides to it. And we have to see how both sides are, uh, can actually serve. So it's not like we're going to um, say every comma is just a totally useless. It's not like that. We're just pointing out what these are. And we also got intellectual comforts. This is the comforts of degrees. I want a degree. It's important to have a degree, to be educated. Sports, big one. Olympics, World Cup, love to watch it. See, so in other words, we all have some enjoyment, right? These are all good. But what we're saying here is these are the kind of categories that people subscribe to in life. Games, sports, uh, you know, all sorts of, you got private games at home, wonderful stuff. The third category is Dharma. Dharma is ethical standards. So in other words, my idea of self-fulfillment is living a, a righteous, moral, noble life, like a wise person. And this is whereby we want to contribute ethically. We sincerely want to contribute. We're generous, we're noble, we're exercising compassion. What's the difference between compassion and empathy, Rani? Okay, compassion is having uh, feelings for others and actually uh, acting on them. Uh, but uh -huh. empathy is uh, feeling sorry, but not uh, directly. Um, you just, um, you share that, Sharing. that uh, feeling, but you're not directly there to actually um, participate or engage. Yeah. So we are generally interested in serving our environment or we even common one is joining an organization for a good cause in the world. Now, if the jiva doesn't know one's nature and they go into number three, 
then every noble cause, what's the ultimate motive behind it? Now, when I say motive, don't look at it as, oh, okay, so you got an agenda. It's just innocent, right? Because the person doesn't know their nature. What's the ultimate motive behind even a noble cause to plant new trees or to save the oceans? Same thing, self-fulfillment. Again, this is not to be looked at good or bad, any of that stuff. Just We're just outlining, pointing out the various pursuits that people are uh, pursuing. The next question is, if the fundamental search, as uh, Lorena has also stated, is for self-fulfillment, right? Permanent, not just temporary, because obviously who's ser searching temporary over permanent? If the search is for permanent fulfillment, then is artha, kama, dharma, are they bringing me closer to this goal of permanent satisfaction or not? Now, of course, if you open this question up to the general public, you're going to get a lot of yeses. So we'll start with a no, and then we'll give an explanation why. Let's look at Artha. And this is what um, Robert was saying. In Artha, whatever goal we have for security, that goal is bound by certain factors like time. Right? We feel secure now, or it depends. We need to wait for something in the future to feel secure. In other words, the right environment, the right variables have to come together, which depends on time for me to now feel secure, right? I need to wait for the COVID, for example, to go away and then I can uh, start something. So in other words, then I'll have my security. But right now, I'm just going to wait it out. Moods. Sometimes our moods about ourselves, our confidence changes. So what was giving us security before, now we lose confidence in ourselves. And we say, I don't know, I'll no longer feel secure in um, you know, someone that's close to me. I don't know, I no longer trust them, right? I mean, this is also something that has to be handled with, but if we put all our trust into them, as in for our you know, sense of security, then this is also subject to a possibility. Moods, how we feel right now. Today, your entire mood is different. Therefore, what you think of what security today compared to some other possibility will be different. Entirely dependent in reference to what happened yesterday. The other is values. What we value changes all the time, depending on our knowledge, right? As we're, you know, the younger we are generally, we have a certain value about life, right? Value is cars, for example, boys, you know, sports and all this other movement and action, um, computer games and all that. But the more we learn, then those values change. Therefore, Artha starts to you know, no longer be what it used to be. And therefore, our life starts to change. Now, sometimes we miss out. We say, oh, you know, the good old days. Hey, did you think like that back then? You know, because usually when we say good old days. Was it really good old days when, you know, it was actually there? No. So we create these stories and we kind of amplify it and we contrast it to that just so we can feel good and say how that was better. So we don't address this moment now. So insecurity from loss, this is what Robert was saying. Having gotten my security, now there's this background concern. I may lose it. And what if? Can I sustain myself without it? Constant, this is like another CPU processing power taking up my, uh, in the background, like having a high CPU load in the computer. The fan spinning out loud, it's just there noticeable. The other is concerned about maintenance. So obviously we get something and then what's natural, what, what happens then? We have to take care of it, buy a new car. One scratch, <laughs> the person loses it, right? And then after two years, right? You're like, okay, scratches here and there, bird poops, so on. You know, we get used to it. So uh, all of these variables are there. Now, what about karma? Karma is also bound to variables like the mood, entirely about how the person feels. The person could be right now in Hawaii, Waikiki Beach, with the drink and the sun shining and the lively, you know, wave crashing against the rocks and the breeze brushing and just soothing your face. And it's so lovely. You have your favorite book there and the waiters coming over, giving the food exactly that you ordered. And then you have a sore stomach, right? Food poisoning. Ouch. Entire journey is ruined just on the basis of how your body feels. Or you see something in the background, maybe people get, you know, argue or something and they go, oh, this is not uh, right. And that affects your own state. You're just enjoying yourself. Someone else's business 
has now gotten to affect you. Environment also affects. Again, go back to Waikiki Beach. You're there and suddenly a storm comes <laughs> out of there, right? No matter how much you pay for the ticket, you're still dependent upon these variables of the environment, the mood, and even the health of the body. This is why it is actually incorrect now to start thinking. Okay, so moksha is about feeling, uh, you know, like ecstasy. The logical flaw with that is, so does that mean that if you're 80, 90, right, and you got moksha, uh, and your body's falling apart, hopefully not, then how much ecstasy can you feel compared to when you were younger, 20? Not a lot, in contrast. So therefore, this whole logic of trying to feel something, an associated feeling to moksha, also breaks down. Because all of these things are dependent variables upon the body and upon the mind, upon the age, upon space, and upon time. How about dharma? This is where we join an organization. But you know what happens very soon for some? They go, for example, suppose the United Nations you join. The right? United Nations uh, just apparently does a lot of good work, and they do or the World Health Organization. And then sooner or later you discover how little difference it's actually having on the grander scale of the entire world. And initially so enthused, let me go in there and make an impact. But as you get to know what real difference is it actually making and how little difference it's making in contrast to what's going on in the world every day and how, much, how many reminders it needs for people to actually get the message if they even ever do, you go, wow, even this, there's no fulfillment as much as I thought there is. If these three cannot deliver permanent fulfillment, then according to the book, what can? The book said, moksha. So what are these former three? Artha, dharma, and kama. They are ways to optimize our experience. That's all they are. And that's useful also, because without optimizing our experience, then we're never going to pursue the last purushartha. In other words, optimizing our experience in samsara. If we just focus on the first three, it's basically just uh, kind of like, here's a breaststroke for samsara. Here's a new breaststroke, right? Here's, the, here's a snorkel for samsara and go and enjoy yourself. The last one is about seeing through samsara. Not transcending. There's nothing to transcend here. You cannot transcend the one reality but seeing through, in and through this intelligence, how it's working, the interconnected web. So now what is involved in this Purusharata of Moksha? The first is inquiring into the three pillars. What are the three pillars, um, Justine? What are the three pillars? Uh, Jiva, Jagat, and Ishvara. Good. The first one is inquiring into these three pillars. Also, the person, the Jiva, the inquirer, the aspirant, the genuine seeker, starts to focus on themselves. Because as we said, the jiva is the closest. And we ask, what is the absolute nature of this individual? That's the question that initially hooks us. Well, we want to know now. After having asked all these questions pertaining to the former three, how to get this, how to get that, then we start to ask, what's the nature of this individual who's always wanting to get this and that? And this individual starts to then realize, little by little, through their inquiry, that the very problem is I. The entire problem has been settled on this individual. The individual who was looking for things, not even knowing who this individual was. Therefore, the only solution can be addressing this very individual, the I, the truth behind this individual, the reality uh, behind this individual. The problem is I, the solution is I. No longer the problem is out there. No longer is the problem more dharma, more karma, or optimizing karma, artha, right? None of that. It is entirely my responsibility, my experience, and now let me address this individual. So this is the process where the person just stops opinionating the world, right? There's a shift. No longer wasting time. Let me share my opinion. Like, why? For what for? It is your journey. You're born here for your journey alone. So it's a massive shift. And sometimes even people in Vedanta, I tell you, Advaita Vedanta, still out there comparing gurus, who's saying what, who's doing this, who's still much to learn. So the person starts to put all the focus on this eye. And this 
is what we call uh, going from, as the book said, Jijinatsu. What is the Jijinatsu? Jijinatsu wants to know about these three pillars. That's what a Jijinatsu is. Now, when does the Jijinatsu go from that into a Mumukshu? What is Mumukshu? Desire of Moksha, desire of the fourth Purusharta is when the Jijinatsu, having gone through the three pillars, now starts to see how that applies to the very seeker, to the very Jijinatsu. It's no longer intellectual. Now they go, ah, okay. So the whole purpose of learning this is to remove the notion that I'm actually separate from these other two pillars, from Ishwara and from Jagat. And therefore now the person becomes a desirer for quote union for being at one with the three pillars for understanding one's reality one's truth not being different from the three pillars from all the jivas from the entire world from ishwara itself one and the same and therefore the person is now a mumukshu so what is the jijinatsu still pursuing the path of the three pillars it's still intellectual when it becomes intimate and personal and you see how the problem is I, therefore the solution is I, then the person is a mumukshu. Do we have to give up artha, kama, and dharma to pursue moksha? No, okay, I can see uh, Mina's lips, no. Suppose you go to a mountain, right? You want to be uh, alone there, Himalaya, typical vision, right? Himalaya mountain. And you think it's that easy? You got the weather, cold. Who's going to bring you the food, right? Who's going to pay for the food? Well, you don't have to really pay there, but still you're dependent upon someone else. Therefore, that's still going to be at the back of the mind, right? Are they going to come? What if they forgot about me? What if they're on a date and they're just kind of starving here, right? You could still be worried about uh, school kids. Suppose you're close by and you see school kids not going to school and then you get agitated. Oh, they should be going to school. It's still the same, right? Still person, still concerns. The environment now becomes your new uh, point of focus. So the proper attitude that we have instead of abandoning these former three purushartas, it was just say they are means to an end. Mok, the, uh, kama, artha, and dharma are but means, but instruments, but helpers, first aids to moksha. That's all they are. That's the proper attitude. So they're not meant to be discarded or degraded or uh, looked down upon, just they are there, your friends, the three friends to help you in this uh, most important journey. Therefore, we don't give up duties. And it is often advised, as Krishna advised Arjuna, don't go to the Himalaya mountains. Don't abandon your duties. Because if you do, your Swadharma is still going to be singing inside the mind. And you're going to be meditating, regretting for not having done what needs to be done. Therefore, it is appropriate to thus uh, still pursue one's swadharma because the person being alive has a helpless need to act. Is this not true? Wake up, you act. You just helplessly have a need to do your duties in, within your scope of your environment. Uh, in the Ramayana, for example, we got King Janaka, who uh, was seemingly a liberated king. And he was the king of the entire kingdom of Ayota. So does this mean just because he's a king and because he's you know, liberated, he goes, I don't need to be a king. No, he's still doing a very important duty of being the king. That's a big job. So therefore, liberation does not mean giving up anything, just putting things in the right perspective and knowing that these are but means. As long as I'm alive, I have a duty to the society, to my immediate surroundings. So finally, what is Tattva Jnana uh, Darshanam or commitment to self-knowledge? How would you summarize it in one sentence? What is this about, this value 19? Inquiry into the true nature of the self. Every breath serves as a reminder why I'm here. Every breath. Moments, of, of course, it's not practically um, possible uh, once being with the duties, but generally, metaphorically speaking, Every breath is there to remind you why I'm here. Why am I really born? And that is, as Robert said, pursue the final path, the, the final self-knowledge, which leads to the uh, release from rebirth into another human body. Okay, value 20. Adhyatma jnana nityatvam. Understanding the validity of self-knowledge. So 
Adhyatma, Jnana, Nityatva, centered on the knowledge of the self, is a value for constancy in the study of the scriptures known as the Upanishads and other texts of Vedanta. Nityatva means constancy in scriptural study until self-knowledge is gained, clear and free from doubt. For the gain of any knowledge, the answer to the question, how long must I study has to be until you know it, which means until you understand the subject matter. The gain of understanding is not something for which a specific time can be set. Gain of knowledge is not like a gain of result produced by an action wherein given the relevant factors, the amount of time needed to produce a result by a particular act can be calculated based on experience. For example, in cooking, one can closely calculate how long it will take to cook rice at a given temperature at a particular pressure using a particular cooking method. But the time for understanding cannot be similarly calculated. All that can be said for understanding is that if one wants to gain certain knowledge using the proper means for gaining that knowledge, one must study until the subject matter becomes absolutely clear. If the knowledge you seek is that of calculus, it will not, of course, do you much good to study art or history just because you find it easier. Such a choice would be like trying to see a rose through your ear because you're hearing a sharp and your eyesight is dim. The right means of knowledge must be ascertained and used. However, when you have the right means of knowledge for the knowledge you seek, it is simply a matter of continuing to use that means until the knowledge is gained and is clear and steady. The vision of the dancer is oneself. You are that is the vision of the dancer. The entire Vedanta is about the self, about me, about what I am. In order to understand the scripture, I must clearly understand and keep in mind its basic topic, its basic vision. When the Shastra talks about the world, it is talking about me. When it talks about other worlds, heavens and hells, to which I may go, it talks about me. The purpose of Vedanta is not to throw light upon means and ends, but to illumine the truth of all means and ends. Vedanta involves no means and ends. It just throws light upon what is. Throwing light upon what is is called knowledge. Knowledge is just seeing what is. Vedanta lights up the fact. Whether Vedanta talks about the world or God or about the deities or any other subject, all discussions only throw light upon one basic fact, that there is no difference between the individual, the world, and God. This non-dual fact of the identity of God, the world, and me is tattva, the basic irreducible truth of everything. It is this tattva which is unfolded by the teaching of Vedanta. The words of Vedanta are as much a means of knowledge Pramana, as are my sense organs. In fact, the knowledge given to me by my sense organs upon analysis can be dismissed, whereas the knowledge I gain from the worlds of Adanta cannot be dismissed by any other means of knowledge. Sense organs can reveal to me only the existence of things that are capable of being perceived. But what can be perceived by one means of perception or at one level, intensity or power of a given means of perception can be dismissed by another. Perceptual means or other perceptual level or capability of other means. What is perceived can always be dismissed. Upon sufficient examination, nothing perceivable is, as it appears to be but always is, resolvable onto something else. The perceived blueness of the sky is not really blue. The perceived daily accent of the sun in the eastern sky does not really appear, it does not really happen. Uh, upon inquiry, the perceived flatness of the earth can be dismissed. However, the words of Vedanta give a knowledge that cannot be dismissed. The knowledge unfolded by Vedanta 
that there is a non-dual reality it cannot be dismissed by the perception or any other perception based logic for all logic ultimately is tracked back to a perception base neither by perception nor by logic can the fact of non-duality be dismissed this is how perception and logic play a role in the teaching and study of the vedanta although perception and logic may not reveal non-duality they can never dismiss non-duality and they do not have the capacity the shruti which is heard is an independent means of knowledge that commands from us a respectful attitude towards the pramana that means the words of vedanta which is even greater than the respect held for our eyes and other senses this is true because the senses unlike vedanta can deceive the knowledge upon by my senses is never absolutely true but upon further analysis is always subject to dismissal the facts that our senses reveal is like the truth the blind men gained after each of them heard only one part of an elephant in this traditional story several blind men came upon an elephant an animal none of them had encountered before for a few minutes before the elephant's keeper took it away each of the blind men was able to touch or grasp some portion of the elephant and each was convinced that he knew what an elephant is like they argued vigorously amongst themselves one who had put his arms around one of the huge legs said an elephant i know very well from my personal experience is like a pillar another who had laid his hands flat against the elephant's vast side <clears throat> said no it's it is like a wall the others had different claims an elephant is like a rope said the one who who had grasped the tail idiots you are all deluded an elephant is like a sharp pointed spear implored the one who had touched a sharp tusk the blind man each confidently claimed knowledge on the basis of having touched one part of the animal in what it said there was some truth in the untruth and the untruth was connected to the truth thus the knowledge each had was an untruth containing an incomplete truth connected to truth further inquiry into each of the false truth by the mistaken blind man would lead to recognition that it was untruth or at best the incomplete truth in fact every untruth is always in some sense connected to the truth although perhaps not in such an obvious sense as a leg or trunk is connected to the elephant there is truth when an untruth is known as untruth in this sense every untruth is connected to truth in another sense there is a connection because the very status of untruth is dependent upon some truth a fact that the untruth contradicts or does not com- uh, completely or adequately reflect the truth for example in the classic vedanta illustration of the rope snake in which a coil of rope mistakenly is thought to be a snake an inquiry into the nature of the snake will reveal the rope the rope being the truth of the snake thus in the study of vedanta shravana includes the an- analysis of untruth in order that with the recognition of the untruth as untruth the proper kind of inquiry can be undertaken to reveal the truth the truths sense organ data and logical conclusions based on sense data gathered through the use of one's ordinary means of knowledge are no different from the blind men's elephant's truths um at best such truths are only functional negatable facts immediately useful but subject to contradiction by other truths and by the complete truth so value 20 is understanding of the value of self knowledge and what is value 20 wow well, the whole book actually all everything that we've just talked about is actually an attraction to this knowledge and where is this knowledge found in the scriptures so it's an addiction to the scriptures obviously we have to know what the scriptures are because you know before we get addicted to something we need to know that we're getting addicted to the right thing so uh, before i get there uh, now what about these scriptures now we have to know what is the place that these scriptures have in relation to our search you have to know what's the connection there 
And what is it that we want? We spoke earlier, we're seeking permanent fulfillment. And the scriptures is what talks about how to go about removing the, the notion that we are not already free. Therefore, my connection or my relationship to the scriptures, they offer me a means to remove my notions that I'm not already free right now. What else is this value about? It is about constant and systematic study of Vedantic scriptures for a length of time under the guidance of a competent acharya. I already said this before, the definition of jnana yoga. Therefore, it is a constant and consistent study. What about the scriptures? Like, what are the scriptures? What part and role do they have? So the scriptures, they define what reality is. They show us what the reality is. There are statements about reality, which once we look into them, we can then arrive to what they are trying to show us. And they require our investigation because we cannot just read a statement like Tatwa Masi, we need to look what it means in order to understand it. In other words, we need to carefully examine the statements of the, uh, the scriptures, which cannot be contradicted if we were to try to contradict them. So what do I mean by this? The scriptures cannot be contradicted. Well, let's give you an example. In order for you to say something, something that makes sense, is it not true that it has to have some, it has to be a logical statement? You cannot just say uh, the dog um, went, the dog um, on the glass because computer phone. It's like, huh? What did you say? In other words, in order to say something, you have to have a logical structure in your sentence. Is that not true? And if that logical structure is taken out of your sentence, are you going to make sense? No. In other words, let me show you an example. What happens if you were to do that? And notice how you cannot contradict anything that I say. Because even if you say it, even if you do contradict me, I will just use the very instruments that I'm going to now show you against you. So the first one is to create a logical statement, you need expectancy. Expectancy means there needs to be a, a word that follows the preceding word. For example, if I say bring, and I just stop there, what are you going to say? Bring. What? Bring what? In other words, I haven't finished my statement. So then it needs to be an expectancy after. Bring the jar. So if I just say it, bring, nothing makes sense, even though I still employed the use of words. Can you contradict this? Mm. Because even if you were to say, yes, I can, I would still say, you to say, yes, I can, you still employ expectancy. You said, yes, I can. The second one is mutual fitness in order to create a logical sentence. This is whereby the sentence should not contradict itself. Suppose I say to you, the fire has frozen the water. Does that make sense? The fire has frozen the water. The statement is self-contradictory. In other words, there is no mutual fitness because fire cannot freeze. Therefore, the whole thing falls apart. Third one is proximity of words in order for your sentence to make any sense. Suppose you wanna say, bring me, bring a cow. And you go like this, one day you wake up one morning, ah, bring, ah, next morning, ah, ah. Third morning, ah, cow. You still said bring a cow, but was it appropriate? Was the time interval appropriate? No. So the whole sentence falls apart. The fourth one is intention of the words. So this is whereby the context, to understand the sentence or the context, you need to understand the intention behind the author's words. You need to understand the intention of the author. So for example, suppose the author says, bring a bat. If you do not know what the intention of that is, then you could interpret that in two ways. Either someone's going to get beaten up, right? Bring a bat. Or let me bring a bat so I can show you what a bat is made out of. That could mean two things. So in other words, the context entirely changes one same sentence. Bring a bat. Change the context. 
if you're inside a, you know, a place with kind of dangerous looking men, you know, and they say, bring a bat and you're there by yourself, you're like, uh oh, <laughs> but if you're in a woodworking shop and someone says, bring a bat, you're relaxed. Okay. They're going to show me how a bat, a baseball bat is made Four principles to create a logical statement. Can you contradict any one of them? Because in order for you to speak, in order for you to communicate in this world, you're dependent upon these four variables. The scriptures work exactly the same. They are non-contradictable statements, no matter how hard we try. And then what else did I say? Also, uh, the, the acharya needs to then make sense of these scriptures. Now, what's the point of the acharya? Like with anything, just like mom and dad gives context to the, to the child, right? What is the context of this uh, situation? You know, so they explain, here's the context of this teaching. The teacher also removes the unintended meanings because when a person reads the Gita by themselves, they go, oh, okay, so here's what this means and here's the intention behind it and I've got it. And then I move on to the next one. So the teacher's job is to remove those uh, assumed meanings that we otherwise would think uh, what it actually means. The teacher also resolves apparent contradictions between two verses. One verse says, karma yoga is the best path. Another verse says, jnana yoga is the best path. How do you resolve that? Question for you. How do you resolve that? Karma yoga is the best path. Few verses later, jnana yoga is the best path. What is it trying to say? Um, if you purifying your mind through these means, you can attain the knowledge easier. Because Good. you've got a clarified mind. Good, exactly. So in other words, it's not always uh, teach the highest knowledge. Sometimes you have to look at your niche, the group that you're talking about. For example, I was just watching um, a video by Sadhguru, and he's teaching the he's telling the youngsters in universities and colleges. And what is he teaching? He's very clever. He doesn't go, you know, go and pursue moksha. He says, first thing, go and sharpen up your senses. You know, sharpen up your sight, your vision, your hearing, and then you will be sitting blissed out. Very clever, because the age group is capable of understanding that much. We, are, we call this the chavarka, you know, the, all there is is the senses. Amplify your senses and you'll be living the good life. In other words, you start at the funnel. And where's the biggest funnel? At the bottom. And then as the person goes up, then the funnel gets smaller and smaller and smaller until they arrive to Vedanta. And then usually the person says, you know, see, he was lying. You know, he was not telling the truth. He was telling us to pursue the senses, but no, the teacher knows better. They know we need to address the capacity to which your mind is capable of grasping. Therefore, that's the level that the teacher talks at. A little metaphor. Suppose your eyes are pramana. Pramana is the instrument by which something is picked up. Something is grasped. So your eyes are the pramana. Color that you see is Atma, the self, the final reality. Now, it's, I know it's kind of like, you know, okay, the Atma is over there, right? So Atma, so the Pramana is your eyes. Color is Atma. And the light is the teacher, but also, not only the teacher, you also need something else, a qualified mind. Now, your eyes are open, right? The Pramana is there. The scriptures are there. They're open. You open up the scriptures. And the scriptures have color, talking about Atma. Your eyes are open and they're looking at color. What else do you need? You need the light. You need a qualified mind, but you also need the teacher to illumine both the Pramana, but also to uh, bring light to the scriptures. In other words, the teacher is the interconnecting agent that connects the Pramana and the atma, the knowledge, the color, the eyes and the color illumines it. But also you need a qualified mind. In the text, it's talked about shravanam. For Vedanta to work, we need three processes. Obviously, I will cover shravanam only. And then next week, we will continue the rest. So shravanam is first putting everything you know aside, just a beginner's mind. Like, yes, we know a lot of things. We've heard a lot of things. We've heard many teachers, this and that. We know that. But just for a moment, we're putting things aside and we're listening, reflecting upon what the Upanishads are saying. Of course, under the guidance of the, the interconnecting agent being the teacher. And while doing that, while listening, we should not personally interpret what we're hearing. If we are to interpret, then we need to ask. That's the safest approach to go about Shravanam. So the tendency is to assume, okay, here's what it means. 
move on because I've heard this before. Thanks for thank you for confirming. So rather just ask, right? What what is it, what are you really saying? Is this what you're saying? Let me rephrase or uh, paraphrase what you're saying. So let's take for example Tatwamasi, and the text talked about this. What is this Tatwamasi? It is a Mahavakya, and it is showing the the aspirant the reality. So this Tatwamasi is just showing the connection of these three pillars. Tat, that, Ishwara. Twam, you, the Jiva. And a C is the equation that connects the Jiva and Ishwara and the Jagat. So yes, it is one thing to understand the three pillars, but you need to understand what is the connecting principle that they all enjoy. What is that one reality that connects them all? And this is what a C is talking about. So the question is how to understand this. And I wanted to actually... Um, show you a uh, analogy of water and ocean, uh, give you a picture. I think it's better because then you can just look at the picture and then I'll kind of point out some statements. The analogy of the ocean waves and water. So look at this picture. How do you explain this now in relation to Tatatwamasi? Three ways to explain it. For example, take the wave. The wave is nothing but what? The water. So now what, what are we now bringing in? We're bringing in the jiva, right? So the jiva is equated to the wave. Now the wave and the ocean, they have their being in what? Water. So now we're brought in also Ishwara. So we brought in Tat and we also brought in Twam, Tat Twam. Only after knowing that both of them are enjoying the one same water, then we can say something like, all that is here is ocean. What does this mean? It means that the wave of the past, present, and the future is ocean only. And you, the wave, are the truth of the ocean. Why? Because we just said, you are also the water. In other words, wherever there is ocean, it carries its truth with it, being the water. Now let's tie this in with Mahavakya of Aham Brahmanasmi. In other words, this Mahavakya equates you to the water, the wave to the water. But it's knowing that I am the water, the truth of the ocean. Before the wave came, there was what? Water. While the wave is there, what is there? Still water. After the wave goes, what is there? Still water. What about Mahavakya Tatatwamasi? This Mahavakya says that you, the wave, and Ishwara, the ocean, are one Brahman, one water. In short, you and the ocean enjoy the one final reality, the water. Let's take this with Mahavakya of Isha Vasyam Idam Sarvam. All that is here is the Lord. Lord pervades everything. Here the wave is told, all that is here is the ocean. The jiva is told, all that is here is Ishwara. And every wave of the past, present, and the future is included in the ocean. Not one is out of the ocean. Whoever you talk to is not out of this one reality. And this ocean also has its own truth. And what is that truth? Water. So wherever you are, there is ocean. And wherever ocean is, there is its own truth, the water. So where is there anything other than you? Next week, I will talk about mananam and what mananam involves, removing some doubts. And I will cover some schools of um, the Shishta Dvaita. Dvaita and Purva Mimamsa. And what do they say about moksha? What is moksha in their view? Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramayaha, sarve bhadrani pashyantu, ma kaschit dukha bhag bhavet, om shanti 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 hi. May all be happy, may all be free from illness, may all behold good things, and may no one suffer. Mm -hmm.